Hi, uh, good morning everyone. Because it's Friday, a beautiful day out, and I know that uh, there are uh, obligations that people have, like to our jobs at some point. So we're going to try to wrap up around 9, 9.05. Um, so my name is Joe DeLuca. I am a board member of the California Association of Healthcare Executives, and I chair the co-chair of the Career Development and Transition Committee. Um, one of our roles in career development is to sponsor events like this, which are just basically sort of the intimate 20 people career conversations with leaders in our industry. Uh, very open session, so I'm going to go ahead and make a couple of introductory comments and sort of start some questions off. And then as, um, as we have questions, please feel free to jump in. We are recording this, um, so this little camera here um, is visible to us, you're not visible on this. And the goal eventually, this is actually a, a Wi-Fi hotspot. So we could be broadcasting this to the internet right now or putting it on Facebook. As an organization, we cover California Association of Healthcare Leaders, 1,300 members. We cover from San Luis Obispo to the Nevada border all the way up to Oregon. So one of the goals we have is to eventually do an event like this, have students from Chico, for example, while watching this and possibly bringing in some questions just try to add more value to the membership who's there. And I think mainly everyone in the room is member. Like when I looked at the rosters, there's a couple who are not. Uh, this is uh, 1.5 qualified education units. These are self-reported units. So when you're up for certification, you have to go in and, and put these in yourself. However, we do need you to uh, sign the list. Every once in a while, they come back and audit these to make sure that, that someone's there, not often. Um, okay, so we're here today with David Clark, and welcome to California. Thanks, Joe. And I'd like to um, start by, you and I actually have one thing in common. What's that? That we are probably some of the, well, right, we're losing our hair. <laughs> Side of our industry. Um, we were probably one of the last classes to take the fellowship exam in paper in Chicago. Oh, yeah, yeah. As composed to now the modern ways of doing this. Um, so I'm a little bit curious, so as I was looking back through your background, so you have a finance background. Yes. And then an MBA several years later, and it looks like you were in hospital operations at a smaller facility while you were in school. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, those were, uh, that was back in the day. First of all, so David Clark, and I, I've met many of you. Um, I had the pleasure to, to work with about six or seven of the folks in this room, and uh, it's just great to be a part of community medical centers. I came here almost a year ago. It's gone by fast. Came in uh, May of last year, and... Um, I, uh, I have loved it. It's really nice to be back in California. You mentioned Chico a second ago, and when I heard that, I started getting, I was reminiscing back to my days of junior high and high school. I grew up in Chico. My father was chief of neurosurgery at Enloe Medical Center for uh, a couple of decades. And so um, our roots are here in California, uh, my wife and I, and when we became empty nesters, we decided we want to get back to California. But yeah, we started off running small hospitals out in Texas. So after I uh, received my uh, bachelor's degree in finance, uh, my first job opportunity outside of college was in, uh, of all places, Lubbock, Texas. How many of you have been to Lubbock? I, oh, wow, three of you have, okay. Um, so I was there for four years, getting my MBA at nights, working full time, started off in, a, in an HR department in, in wage and salary administration, and then uh, ran a clinic, neurology and neurosurgery for a year. And then, uh, so I kind of moved quickly, uh, a year in each role, wage and salary administration, clinic administrator in neurology and neurosurgery, and then I was an executive assistant to the chief financial officer, where I learned a lot about budgeting and contracting and capital budgets. So when I was 27 years old, somebody approached me, a friend of mine from church, and he said, hey, there's a little rural hospital 45 miles east of here. You ought to throw your hat in the ring. They're looking for an administrator. And I'm sitting here thinking, I don't have a prayer to get that job. I'm working on my MBA. And by the way, back then, we didn't have executive MBA programs. So I was on the, uh, the four-year plan, going two nights a week. Um, so uh, I didn't think I would have a shot, but I, I threw my hat in the ring and I got it. And uh, so I was 27, almost 28. And I look, I look back on that after about three months in the job, and I realized that the reason that I got the job and nobody else did is nobody wanted it. Uh, it, was a, it was a turnaround job, so you finance and, and uh, accounting folks, you'll appreciate this. We had a, it was an 89% debt ratio, um, five or six days cash on hand, employees hadn't had raises for five years, uh, paint was literally peeling off the walls in the, in the main entrance of the hospital and in the emergency department you could see paint peeling off the walls. So it, it was truly a turnaround. Now this is 105 employees. 
and um, three physicians. And uh, at the time, it had a negative 9% margin. So now that's on a base of about uh, $6 million, okay? So very small operation, and I'm going back, you know, almost 25 years. And um, so it, it was a big turnaround. Now the reason, one of the main reasons I took that is because it had an affiliation agreement with the bigger hospital in Lubbock, and they assured me that I would get some uh, leadership support and mentoring. So I felt like I had, uh, I was putting on my belt and suspenders, you know, having their backing. And they helped me tremendously. And it's part of St. Joseph Health System out of Orange. They've got a big West Texas uh, division. So um, that affiliation helped tremendously, having good mentors. And that's one thing I want to say is, I think uh, for everybody uh, who gets into this business, it's really important to have good mentors around. But yeah, it was a great experience. I was there for four years. We turned it from an 89% debt ratio to a 40% debt ratio, from uh, five or six days cash on hand to 60 days cash on hand. and. Um, and employees got raises each of those four years. It took, we, we incentivized everybody, all 105, and that was back in the days, I loved it. I knew every one of my employees on a first name basis, but when you're running a hospital that has an average daily census of 11, and you gotta get to about 16 to break even. When I left, we were at 21, but it, it's, it's easy to get to know everybody in a small operation. So I loved uh, running a rural hospital. In fact, I, I attribute that to learning more about operations than anything else. If, I'll tell you today, I mean, this is a this is a beast. It's a tough job to, to be COO of this hospital, but um, it's equally challenging running. In fact, it might even been I could even argue it's tougher to run that one because it really was a this is not a turnaround. This is a a strong hospital. Um, so anyway, but those are great experiences, and, and I think a lot of the folks in the room know this. I wouldn't trade that for anything. There there are nights when I'd get home. A quick example: I was uh, getting my MBA at nights. I'd get home at nine thirty or ten. Uh, PM and uh, you know wife two kids and I remember being absolutely exhausted and thinking the only time I can get my homework done is now because you know I was getting to work at 7 a.m. and coming home about 7 or 8 at night it was really tough those four, four years but um, I just had to you got to have a lot of resilience you got to push yourself that's something else I've learned about healthcare administration you're gonna get a wide variety of tasks you're juggling a lot of balls when you're running a rural hospital you don't have a lot of bench strength and so there aren't a lot of really smart people to delegate things. You've got to learn to do strategic planning and budgeting and physician recruiting and uh, understand your joint commission standards. And, but all within the same hour. All within the same hour, yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was a great experience. So you mentioned the uh, value of mentorship. Um, and it's, it's one thing that, that we offer as a program. Um, what do you consider to be the most important characteristics of a mentor? So for those who are, who are interested in picking up a coach mentor, what should they be looking for from your experience? Somebody who's a really good listener and um, who can show some empathy and uh, to really put themselves in your position and uh, try to understand what your needs are. Because there are some people who would have zero interest in going and being a, well, for example, a rural hospital CEO. You know, they might prefer, you know, I'd, I'd rather be in a bigger city. You know, so you got to weigh everything, you know, your quality of life and your balance. And, so you want a mentor who can really connect with you, who understands your values, because everybody is different. My career path is very different than John Cass or Vivian or Matt. Um, there are so many different ways to, and not everybody wants to be a CEO. I think we as um, healthcare leaders need to listen and find out what, what are their core competencies, what are they passionate about. I've talked to many um, folks over the years. When I was a regent for the state of Utah, back when I was, in, uh, it was a regional CEO of Intermountain Healthcare for, um, 11 years and uh, so I've mentored a lot of folks over the years and I, I try to there have been many who I've steered into hey you gotta go be a VP of strategic planning somewhere go be a VP of HR um, and there have been some who say you know what I, I don't want to put in that kind of time I want to have a, a life outside of so <coughs> so there are a lot of good and honorable positions in healthcare and uh, a lot of different ways to get to whatever your, your goal is so find the right mentor who will listen and customize their advice to you how many have you had in your career? Uh, gosh, I would say. And, and were they formal or sort of informal? Uh, yeah, those are great questions. Probably, I, I would consider probably four people who are strong mentors, and um, I would say two of them were formal and two were informal. Yeah, but I also feel like I'm still being mentored. You know, I, I love to study the lives of good leaders who are values driven, um, who uh, you know have integrity and a strong work ethic. Um, outcomes oriented. So, uh, but yeah, I would say probably four good, good mentors who have really had a, 
a, a lasting impression on me in my career. So, um, father was a physician, and did your mother work in healthcare as well? Or sort of. Uh, sort of. She, she uh, was a volunteer social worker. Um, so we had a lot of kids living at our house growing up. We had probably 20 people living. We had a we had a bedroom at the end of the hallway, and we'd have some kids would stay for three days, and others would stay for three months. So she just helped out people in need, really from. This is up in Northern California. We'd have people fly, like we had a teen, a teen uh, expectant mom who flew in for three months and delivered her baby, then flew back to wherever she was from. And so, yeah, mom had that uh, very uh, charitable person, uh, very compassionate. And my dad was very driven, very goal oriented. So, so some might look at that and go, you're not a doctor. Um, was that an expectation at some point? And sort of what was your passion? What was the, yeah. the click in the healthcare? Uh, that, that's a great question. You know, growing up, my dad never pressured us kids. There were five of us in the family, five kids. Never pressured us or expected us to be doctors, but I, I gave it a try. I, mean, I, I looked into it in college, took zoology and chemistry, and, and you know, did okay, B pluses, A minuses. But um, then I started taking finance and um, economics and, and really had a passion for that. So. But I wanted to go into healthcare. Uh, that's pretty much all I knew growing up. I've got uncles and uh, grandpa who's a doctor, a lot of doctors around me. Uh, but I, I knew from a very young age, number one, I didn't want to work over 100 hours a week like my dad, who was always on call, never saw him, <coughs> two, days, two nights a week. And then on, then on Sundays at church, he'd always fall asleep because he was so tired. Um, so I thought, no, I, I, I'm not willing to pay the price to work 100 plus hours a week. So I thought I'll go into the, the management side of healthcare. And I'll be a hospital CEO somewhere, and um, so that was my goal at about 17, because um, I wanted to give back, and I knew it was a very noble industry and a noble profession. Now, by the way, on the 100-hour week thing, if you want to be a healthcare executive, it's probably about 100 hours enough. <laughs> Maybe not 100, but it's, it's a lot of hours. But you don't. But the phone doesn't ring in the middle of the night very much, like neurosurgeons. So. Now the email goes off. Yeah, that's right. Sort of around that. Um, so one of the issues that I think in particular early and mid-careers deal with is the, the concept of a career plan. And it's uh, a little bit, I would say, I'll use the word controversial or unsettled that so ACAG has a very formal career planning tool. Some people <coughs> use it, some people don't. Um, did you plot out a career path at some point? It seems like you, um, you moved pretty quickly into the C-suite, well, into the uh, C-suite of one. Right. Yeah, uh, I, I did. Uh, I, I did in, in uh, during my undergrad. I put one together, but you know that changed about every three to five years. I'd sit down and, and kind of reevaluate and modify that plan. So, but I, I still remember back when I was in college, my goal was to be a hospital CEO. But I, I didn't know much about it. Like, what does that mean? Is that a twenty bed hospital? Is that a thousand bed hospital? But, but I, I just thought it'd be pretty cool to be a, a leader of a, of a hospital. So. But then as time has gone on, I've modified those plans a bit. And, um, and one of the things when I interviewed here a little over a year ago, I told Craig Wagner, I said, you know, I'm not real hung up now on what my title is. Uh, yeah, I've spent a lot of time as a CEO, but I've also spent a lot of time as COO. And I let him know that I'm wired more like a COO from my early days running those rural hospitals in, in Crosbyton and Dumas, Texas. So. So, that, so one might say that's a concept of you have to move um, sideways to move up sometimes or sometimes yeah. to find the right job. I think right so. Job, so. In fact, I've got kind of a, a unique career path. I left one of the strongest health systems in America and did a turnaround job in Philadelphia, and that was by design. Um, I had recruiters tell me, your, uh, I, I had a couple of recruiters tell me pretty much similar messages. They said, you've almost had it too good. You were at one of the top health systems in America. It's almost like walking in, on, it's on autopilot. It's got a, Good, good payer mix, outstanding leadership, physicians who are in strong alignment. They can employ doctors out there in Utah, not in California. So there's a lot of alignment around clinical programs and appropriate utilization of tr uh, clinical protocols. And um, So doing that for 11 years was great, but I had somebody say, you know, you've never really had your butt kicked by going out and um, working in a union <coughs> hospital. You ought to go do that. And I had to remind them, but you know, I ran a couple of rural hospitals and one was a turnaround and one was not very stable. And uh, he said, yeah, that accounts for something. But he said, you need to go somewhere rough. Go to the East Coast or something. And I remember my parents <laughs> told me that uh, my dad went to Hahnemann, which is in Philadelphia. And they said, you've got to have an East Coast experience. John's from Pittsburgh. And uh, I loved it. My wife and I loved the Philadelphia area. We lived in a suburb. It was beautiful. Uh, the city had a, a, you know, has a lot of diversity, great restaurants, great sports towns. So we loved Philly. 
But I'll tell you, that was the toughest job I've ever had. I was there for two years. I was president of four hospitals. We went through a major merger with Trinity Health. And, um, and then my father passed away of cancer, totally unexpected. And I need to be back west, closer to where my, mo my mother has dementia. So uh, I left for personal reasons. And um, but that was a tough job. But I learned a lot out there, because uh, I've been labeled as being too nice. And I've been labeled as, oh, can you make tough decisions? Uh, that's OK. So uh, in Philly, you learn to be a little more direct. And I like that. I, I really More admire people. In the market too. A lot of competition. <laughs> you got to think quickly and you got to move quick. Because mm -hmm. when you're number four, we are the num number four as far as market share. You know, you've got Penn out there and Jefferson and Mainline. And then uh, my health system is Mercy, which is now part of Trinity. But we have, uh, I think there are 105 hospitals in Philly. And the consultants would tell us, well, Philly's way over bedded because Philadelphia is shrinking the population. And I had, you know, consultants are saying you probably need 80 hospitals in this metro area. You don't need it over 100. So there's a lot of that going on right now: consolidation, downsizing, rifts left and right. So tough market, but uh, I learned a lot. So um, you mentioned your your father's passing and your mother's current situation. Um, as an administrator, what has those experiences taught you about our system? Uh, you know. Uh, as, as hard as it is to even talk about death of a loved one, I still remember that last week of life my dad had. I mean, he was running marathons, he was doing humanitarian trips to Ethiopia, and his dad lived to be 109. So nobody expected my dad to die at 78. Um, so he was diagnosed on a Friday, and two weeks later he was gone. So I was with him his last week, and uh, I still remember how kind and compassionate those nurses were, and those physicians. And it, it, it really does uh, sensitize you more. It helps you to have more empathy about why it is that we try to make a healing connection with every one of our patients and then to not take any of them for granted, to believe in the, the dignity of life. And so, um, yeah, all those things really were profound for me. Good messages. Now, you are also on, or either half served or may still be on the accreditation uh, board, the Joint Commission Standards Board. Um, how is that carried into your work there? Um, I, I did that for three years. Um, after I was a regent for, the, for, for ACHE in Utah, I did that for three years. Uh, and so when that term ended, I was appointed to represent ACHE, one of two appointees for the, uh, the Joint Commission Professional and Technical Advisory Council. So what I learned very quickly is I was one voice of about 64 on that advisory council. I don't know that I had much of an impact, but at least it gave us a voice to weigh in a little bit. But it did give me a greater appreciation for the standards of compliance that Joint Commission has in place and why that's important. So I felt like I had an inside track on getting to know the, the standards really well and to better prepare me for when Joint Commission comes. And I, I'm really happy to say that uh, we just went through a Joint Commission survey, uh, community medical centers, and, and all three of our, uh, all four of our hospitals did really well, the three acute care. And so, um, I'm really, really proud of that, and I'm proud to be a part of a system that really has high standards of quality, and you appreciate that through understanding the Joint Commission regs. So I'm going to imagine that um, through your career you've had a couple of crucial conversations, um, both that you were giving and possibly receiving. Um, are there any that particularly stand out as learning experiences um, or changes of course? Uh, I, I remember... Uh, I remember negotiating with some neurosurgeons to maintain our um, trauma designation. And it was interesting because we had a project list of, there are like 85 open issues. And it took three years to get this level two trauma designation. And um, I won't say where, but um, these three neurosurgeons were the, the, the final um, stone in the foundation. You know, you gotta have your, and when, you, when you think about it, the foundation of a trauma program, general surgery, orthopedics, neurosurgery, I mean, there are specialties you've got to have. And the neurosurgeons were the last to hold out, and they knew it. And those negotiations went on for 10 months. And we were meeting um, every other Monday morning at 6. And I still remember the day when um, I, I, had, I was feeling the pressure to get this thing done, because we, we had already scheduled. We thought, you know what, we've got to bring this to closure. So we had to schedule these surveyors to come out months in advance. And so, I had, you know, the time was just getting away, we are getting close to the deadline, and finally they came in, I gave them a number, I'm just kind of summarizing very quickly, but you know, they wanted this much, and fair market value was this much, and so, you know, we, 
we had to give a little later to. And bottom line is uh, we got them to sign, but it was it's really tough to go through that. Now you fast forward today, and all three of those guys are friends of mine. One of them is we're very close. And uh, I learned a lot from it. They learned a lot, but it was tough. So a lot of the things in leadership, as many of you know, uh, one of the most frustrating parts for me is when you're working on a lot of like physician contracts. In fact, this is probably a good example with the trauma program, your level one. Um, a lot of them don't happen overnight or even in a week. It might take several months to bring to closure. So you've got to be patient, you've got to be persistent, and you've got to be resilient. Because you're going to feel like you're getting punched in the stomach on a lot of days. <laughs> the other one is probably when we were having to go through a restructuring in Philadelphia. Three of my hospitals were in the inner city, and the other one was a uh, suburb. And just having that crucial conversation with management that, hey, as, as, as people resign, we, we are totally transparent, totally honest. As people resign, we have to look at every single position and realize there are no sacred cows. Anyway, two of the, my hospitals were four miles away. So if a manager over here resigned, well, guess what? This manager was over both departments and so forth. But we went through that uh, 12 different management jobs that were consolidated in that two-year two period. That, that was tough to have those conversations. But you know, people want to know why before you make a tough strategic decision. And we need to take the time and be patient and explain it to them. And um, even though it's, it can be a really tough message, I think people will respect that. Because they'll see right through you if you're trying to manipulate or whatever. So that was important. So you mentioned that, that you were regent. Um, what was that experience like? I think many, many of our uh, colleagues aspire to be the regent, or at least are curious about yeah. it. Um, we have the chapter model here, right? That's what we're talking about, different people. Chapter, okay. right. um, it, it was good. It was really good, especially, I, I'm being totally honest, my first two years, I loved it. When I was getting down to the last year for my term, I was starting to count the days. I thought, there's a lot of work here. But one of the things I learned is to <coughs> delegate more to that. When you have a chapter, and uh, which I did, it was, it was back when we first went to that chapter model, and so I felt very grateful for that because we had, I think, 10 or 12 people on, on the advisory board, and there are a lot of them who are eager to help. And when we went to the chapter model, it was fantastic because I could delegate more. We'd have somebody in charge of education or membership development or fundraising or the executive roundtables, whatever. So I, I learned a lot about delegating. That was important. I learned a lot about uh, choosing the right people. You know, and this, these are volunteer roles, and so getting people to step up is important. But I did learn from a career development perspective, um, um, volunteering on your, in your chapter is really important. If you can get, you know, start off getting on a board or being on a committee, and, and uh, you learn a lot about the college, and there's so many good opportunities, not only for the education component, but the networking. And so um, I've never regretted it. It was a great experience. But, but I'm just telling you, the last, you know, especially the last like six months, I was just, I, at the time we were about to expand two of my three hospitals out in Utah. And there's just a lot on my on my plate, and so um, I was ready to hand over the baton. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a marathon that you sprint to yeah. in a certain yeah. way. I I know the activities along the way. Um, so you mentioned networking, and there is formal networking, informal networking. Uh, what role has that played in your career? How have you managed your networking? I have to admit, I did I did more networking earlier in my career than I do today. I still do it from time to time, but it might it's different. You get you get lifelong friends in this business. It, it, it's a it's a very very rewarding business, and so I've got colleagues out in uh, Philly and Dallas and, and uh, Salt Lake City, and, and I still pick up the phone. Or, or it's it's more common now to just send a text or an email, just check in how you're doing, and everyone's busy. So even if we just connect for five minutes here and there. It's great. You just get you just kind of pick up where you left off, and you you share an experience, or you ask them for a, a favor on you. Yeah, yeah. What you learn from what such and such an experience? I'm going through something similar right now, and it's great when you can have that kind of access. And somebody might just answer a tough question I have in under five minutes, and uh, and I try to do the same. I think networking is important. So that might be uh, a technical question, or a management question, yeah. or. Uh, personal question and perspective, yeah. motivation. Something like I can that. tell you one of the most important networking calls I made was just over a year ago when uh, Craig Wagner offered this job to me uh, because he has some roots out in Utah as well. We work for different health systems, but um, we had a mutual friend and I learned about it through our interview process. And uh, I found out because when he mentioned the mutual friend, he used to be a regional CEO at Intermountain, 
because there, there are five regions of Intermountain, and he ran the largest, and I ran the second largest. So I called that guy to get a reference on, on Wagner. Well, Wagner called the same guy to get a reference on me. So. <laughs> but um, it helped me to, to land this job. So it's, it's really a small community. The longer you're in this, it's a small community of healthcare leaders. So. Did you later compare notes? Uh, we actually did, yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're pretty consistent, thank goodness. So qu questions from, we've got, we've got a wide group of people here, perspectives. They talk uh, about, about uh, kind of the mentorship and value and integrity. In your in your relationships with um, making difficult decisions with physicians, how does that value integrity, fairness? How does that um, how does that how does that part of the equation? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question, and, and you you know this, but if, if you yeah. ever if you ever make a commitment to a physician mm -hmm. and you don't follow up. Your integrity, your credibility goes, it's, it's flushed down the toilet pretty quick. And I gotta tell you, I, I, I'm a little nervous about that. This little black book right here, I take this with me all over the place to meetings I go to. And you know, when I was brand new, I was writing detailed notes because I was just trying to figure out who's on first and all these names were thrown at me, Dr. So-and-so or whatever, this is a big place. Um, but if I make a commitment to somebody, I know I've got to follow up. And so uh, usually at the end of the day, I just got, kind of go whipping through that to make sure I've, uh, you know, if I owe somebody an email or a phone call, so. So in those crucial conversations, when, when you, I, I think, I think, and, and what I've learned from my own experience is, uh, in those crucial conversations, how do you, uh, physicians have one expectation, the hospital has possibly another expectation. How, how do you balance those yeah. expectations? And, possibly meet the needs of the physician while also meeting yeah. the needs of the hospital? That's another really good question. In fact, uh, here's a real life example, okay? It happened yesterday. So I'm sitting in a meeting with um, a couple of doctors and a group practice manager, and one of them made an allegation, something about, gosh, it seems like we've been talking about this for three months and nothing's happening. So I decided, okay, their leader knows that a lot has happened, but this person who just entered the dialogue doesn't know the background. Number one, don't assume that the leader of a group is gonna share everything with the troops. You tell one physician, you tell one physician. Now some of them are good about you know, spreading the information so it cascades, but in this case it didn't happen. So I, I learned, you know, a little, little uh, flag went up, and I, so I took about five minutes and I said, let me tell you about what we've been working on the last three months. And I started outlining all the efforts and then that physician kind of calmed down. He realized, oh, okay, there has been a lot going on beyond. And, I, and what I told him is, now, if, if you'd like us to communicate differently, maybe give, give you direct updates from time to time, I'm happy to do that. Let me know your cell phone number, I'll send you a text. Um, or, and I, and I pointed to the leader, and I said, or, or if, if you want to bring him in, or you know, maybe when I send you a little email update, feel free to forward it. Um, so once they understand the why, again, it's, I think it, it, it means a lot. Because everybody in this room, I think, has worked with doctors. And you, know, you look at them more like a small businessman. And, and if they hear an administrator say, oh yeah, we'll move in that direction, they interpret that as they just made the decision, yes, and hopefully it's going to be done tomorrow or the next day. And yet, you get, sometimes you're putting together a, a complicated contract, you know, a 34-pager in this case, and you've got all your compliance issues and legal issues and so forth. And so uh, it's tough. It's really tough. And I learned a lot of that, of that from my father that, uh, because he was a solo neurosurgeon for so long before he brought on a partner. But, you know, they like to go fast. And, and, and they're very decisive. Think about surgeons. They're making life and death decisions on a, on a regular basis. And, uh, and so they're wondering, why can't you guys move faster? So that's probably one of the, the greatest challenges that I think we will all have in healthcare leadership is to be realistic and help them understand the process that we need to go through and, and explain the why's. You know, why, and, and what I'm noticing is more and more, especially the seasoned physician leaders, they, they get it, they understand it. They, they know that uh, maybe uh, you have a handshake and an agreement in principle on a contract 
but it still might be a couple weeks before you're going to sign that contract because of it moving through the process. But it's protect, and we really emphasize this, it's protect you and to protect us to make sure the interests of both parties are served. So, so you've been, you've worked for mission-oriented organizations as well as community nonprofit or in our mountain. Um, do you see any differences in the approaches of delivery? Um, not, not really, not really. Now, I've never, uh, yeah, they've all been nonprofit, by the way. Um, never worked for a for-profit health system before. I've got friends who have. And um, what I like is when it comes to the mission and the vision and the values, for the most part, there's a lot of similarities. But as far as the day-to-day -day operations, I hear there's a little bit of a difference, but I don't know that it's really profound anymore. Not Probably not as much as when I first got into it 25 years ago. Um, so, you know, but I, but I, I personally, everyone's got to make their decision. One of my best friends, who was the best man at my wedding, he's CEO of a large hospital out in Idaho, and uh, he works for HCA, and we exchange notes, and there's not a big difference as far as the way, because we, you know, we've got to maintain uh, excellence in all that we do as far as, you know, supply chain management, revenue cycle management, labor and productivity mm -hmm. management. Um, the, the next big frontier for us is utilization management with our physicians. And uh, some of them are doing okay with that, but, but others aren't. So uh, when I exchange notes, I mean, they're working on the same things. Now, maybe their expectations for their shareholders on margin is higher than what we have, but you know, probably not that profound either, so. <coughs> what, what, about, what about verbiage and language? Is that something that's going to be important? Yeah, because that's going to be important. Yeah, because that's going to be important. Yeah, pretty much has a lot of market share, making a lot of good money. So you go to Philadelphia, and now you're with a company that, that I don't want to say that is struggling financially, but has more competition in yeah. the market. Are the competencies different when you go from a hospital that's doing well to a hospital where there's more competition? I mean, did you notice any change? In the Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, um, one of the things about my experience at Intermountain, it was a very positive experience. Um, a lot of the culture there is uh, consensus driven. And so you might have committees where you're building consensus as far as going in the right direction. And then, you know, six months later, a great decision is made. Now, they got much better when I was there. Deloitte came in, they evaluated um, our decision making process. They called it uh, decision rights and meeting management. And it was about, okay, wait a second, folks. You know, the CEO basically said, okay, time out. We're spending way too much time in meetings, and we're, we're taking way too long to make decisions. And when Dr. Sorensen did that, it was a great move. Deloitte came in, and three months later, they gave us a list like this of all the things we're doing well, but they said, but you've got to work on this list. And they talked about identifying on the front end, you know, having charters, like what we do here at Community. Right. We talk about what are the goals and objectives of this committee, what are the key deliverables, who are the participants, what's the meeting frequency, and all that stuff was kind of wired with me at Intermountain. Um, when I went to Philly, and you were right, both those things that you said, financially very challenging, okay, razor thin margins, Three tenths of one percent operating margin. Okay, when I first got there, um, but as a system with the roll up, it was about one point one percent. Okay, um, so really tough compared to Intermountain. When I left there, it was about an eight and a half percent operating margin. So um, very different. You had to shorten the cycle as far as implementation. You might not have the time to build consensus for three months. That might be three days. <laughs> so it's it's evaluating much quicker, taking decisive action quicker and implementing quite a bit faster, so. What do you think of the community and social care experience from Philly? Because you said it was so different from previous experiences. Does it apply now? That can apply now? Yeah. Um, I, I think that, uh, uh, frankly, I think that that experience helped to prepare, prepare me for, for here because even though, now here in uh, Fresno, we're the market share leader, and that's a great feeling, but, but we also know we cannot take that for granted uh, because it, it's, our, um, it's our privilege to be, I mean, we're the busiest emergency department trauma center in the state. And so on any given day, we have over 300 visits in our ED. We do about 112 to 115,000 ED visits a year. And so um, never a dull moment here. And when you think about our uh, demographics, our payer mix, it's our privilege to take care of everybody in need. Uh, but it can be tough. It can be really, really tough when, and so with all the uncertainty on the horizon with um, 
you know, repeal and replace, and who knows what the next healthcare model will look like. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of nervousness in the industry. We have the margin to be sustainable in the long term. So from Philly, I learned a lot about uh, um, I learned a lot about cost containment in Intermountain. I don't want to come across wrong. One of the reasons why they are so successful is they're very predictable, and it's all about learning and implementing best practice. And they do that at every level. And they're probably the best. Well, Mayo, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Kaiser, when it comes to um, clinical protocol. Uh, but I still remember when the, when the new CFO came eight years ago now, but from Houston, he said, I want to be known as not only best practice clinically, but also operationally. So there's a lot of rigor around supply chain and labor and productivity management and so forth. So I feel like I learned a lot of that at Intermountain, but I had to do really well out of necessity in Philadelphia to implement and implement quick. So now coming to Fresno, that experience in Philly prepared me well because I see here the diversity of this population and um, without going too, too long, but you know, we know our volumes are going to be really high. The question is, are we going to be at 100% occupancy tonight or are we going to be at 96% occupancy? And I'm, I'm counting observation beds too. Peel that out and still it's 86% you know, occupancy. And uh, so are we going to have enough staff? Are we going to have enough hands on deck to take care of the patients? But we're making decisions very quick. And we've got some great managers and directors who have been well trained in that. So, um, but just having that appreciation of where the rubber really hits the road, I'm a strong advocate of having great frontline managers. They have more influence than just about anybody. And I learned that in Philly because we had, out of necessity, very big, uh, um, you know, when it comes to span of control, I'd have managers out there that would have like 40 direct reports. The experts will say keep it to 18 to 20, but uh, out of necessity we couldn't. So we've learned that uh, we have to be more innovative and uh, more collaborative in um, staffing these hospitals. Does that help? Does that, okay. Patrick. So one of the things I, I love about operations is the constant change of right. You never know what you're going to make every day is different. Um, how do you prioritize the, the challenges that you get presented with every day and what you can tackle, what you can delegate? Um, and also, how do you also juggle and prioritize the, the, the needs from your teams, your senior leadership teams, and then also the community events that you need yeah. like this? Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. I wish I had a good answer for that. I think on a scale of 1 to 10, I may be a, a 7 or an 8, 10 is the highest. Um, I, I need to improve on that. But I, I think as far as the way we prioritize our time, and Patrick's right, you're going to have all kinds of things, if you don't already, that are tugging at your time whether it's a community event, or maybe it's a strategic issue that relates to a senior management or your board, or it might be an operational issue that relates to your team, your direct reports. And yeah, I, I'm constantly challenged by that. I mean, John knows this, we co-chair a team uh, on uh, drug costs, okay? An operations improvement team on drug costs. Well, we all know drug costs are going up way too fast. But because we have trust, there might be a meeting that I just, I can't physically get there, so I'll call in. Uh, or, or vice versa, because John's in the same boat. He's COO of our, our other big ho other hospital. And so, um, anyway, uh, it is really tough. But I, you know, and sometimes I have to have those heart-to-heart -heart talks with my boss about, you know, what are the priorities? And if that means, you know, and he's even told me, if you need to cancel a meeting, cancel a meeting. And we just have to understand that. And I, I like that about... But you know what, you don't, you don't earn respect and trust overnight. So when you're brand new to an organization, you feel like you have to go to everything. And that's what I've been doing. And uh, until recently, in the last month or so, I've thought, oh, wait, wait a second. We've got these five people going to that meeting. I don't need to go. They can represent us well, take good notes, bring them back. So we're learning to do more of that as a team. I look at Matt Jossen over here and what we're doing with orthopedics right now. And there's a ton of legwork that Matt's doing that maybe six months ago, I would have felt like, uh, well, I need to do this because I, I don't, I'm learning this new system and so forth. But then I started thinking, no, 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 I, I, Matt can handle that. I, I don't need to micromanage. So we've got to make those kinds of decisions every day. But as, as we all know, if you hire somebody brand new and you're the leader, you're their boss, well, yeah, you're going to be spending a disproportionate share with that person getting them trained. And you're just kind of praying that, okay, after they get on the top of that learning curve, they're going to be a lot more independent and I can kind of back off there and focus my energy somewhere else. 
So it's, it's very fluid, and you're right, Patrick, every day is different. There's a lot of variety, as you know. Um, learning to prioritize is, I think, one of the toughest leadership traits that we have to work on every day. Do you use any form of a, of a daily management system? And, and there's a lot of different frameworks out there that I do. some people use. You know, I've tried different things. Um, and, you know, I came from Provo, Utah, and Stephen R. Covey was um, a, a neighbor. And um, I'm friends with his oldest son, Stephen M. R. Covey, who wrote that book, The Speed of Trust. It's a great book, put in a plug for Stephen. But, uh, but there are a lot of good time management systems I learned from Covey years ago. But what's work, what works for best for me is Management 101, getting out an Excel spreadsheet, and I update it every week. And uh, I've got all these initiatives I'm working on, but I'm kind of a visual person, so I just pull it out. And, uh, and, and I just kind of, so it's, it, it's whatever the task is, and then whatever the deadline is, and then a status report. And I don't type a lot, just little prompts that I understand. But it's also good for my assistant, so she knows, so we're both on the same page, so. So then from those rows, you can sort of prioritize. Yeah. My days of track of yeah. track and activity. And then every Monday morning, she helps me tremendously. Monday morning, Friday afternoon, we, we look at the next week. Usually it's Friday afternoon. And, uh, and there are times when we have to make tough decisions. I, I can have to bump this a week, or, or I can't come to this one, or shorten this from an hour to 30 minutes. And so she helps me a lot. So, so you introduced uh, uh, the uh, concept of Covey, and as you're aware, there's many different frameworks for personal motivation and progression out there, John Maxwell being one that, mm -hmm. that I personally have followed. Um, and I never quite got Tony Robbins until I couldn't sleep a couple weeks ago on the road. I was watching about <laughs> two in the morning, all of a sudden, you know, he came up there and I sort of got that a little bit. Is there one that you have used or adopted? Um, probably Stephen R. Stephen R. Cutler. So, yeah, the framework. I, I just, just like his framework, framework. yeah, yeah. about, uh, you know, first things first and, you know, all of his guidelines are just, they're kind of easy to read. Seek first to understand. Yeah, seek first understand. to understand is a great one. I believe you can't be a good leader unless you're doing that. you got to understand your audience, who you're talking to. So. Yeah, seek first to understand uh, before you're understood. So. And then when, you, uh, when the day comes when you hang it up and you look back at your career, what do you hope that people remember about you or what your legacy is or what, what do you want to be remembered by? That's a great question. Um, uh, professional related, uh, which is not as important as personally how I want to be remembered, but professionally I want to be remembered as um, somebody who could come into a community, assess the community needs, and raise the bar on quality, service, access, and cost. So, and and, and that might. And by the way, and I can look back on those 11 years in uh, in Provo, Utah, and 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 I, I do have a lot of pride in that. Frankly, I mean, it's not. I mean, it wasn't me. It's a team effort, as we all know. It's a, it, these are team sports, but you know, bringing in a heart surgery group. At a time when there's a lot of turbulence, revolving door, about every two years, heart surgeons would come and go. And the three that I recruited there 15 years ago are still together. It's a unified group. And you look at their outcomes, you know, what it used to be, Salt Lake City, Provo. And over time, it's just, you know, the rising tide lifts all ships. The group in Salt Lake's doing better. But now that they're collaborating, the big group in Provo, the big group in Salt Lake, and the whole community's better off because of that. And, I, and so I might have been a small piece of that, but it, it gives me a lot of gratification to see that. So I still have friends and relatives that live there. And I, anyway, so yeah, the, those things are gratifying. So it's often said that organizations such as Intermountain or Kaiser, because of, of their large presence in the market, can shift the curve, whether it's a quality curve or a cost curve, just by um, adopting practices that then become the community standard of care. Do you see that community? has that opportunity I do. as well. Yeah, and, and as we all know, um, in a community like here in Fresno, you've got a lot of doctors on, these are open medical staffs, and so you have doctors who are, you've got a lot of this cross-pollinization going on, you know, from a Clovis community to community regional to St. Agnes. Um, so doctors are learning new things, you know, whether it's through their professional associations or from their own local medical staffs. And uh, competition's good, competition's healthy. And if someone's doing something better than we are, we want to know what they're doing and how they got there. And, and we, want, we know we've, we've got to raise the bar, too, to be uh, competitive. So I believe that it's, uh, I believe it's, a, it's a competitive landscape here in Fresno. 
and I think it's really good for the community because we're, we're constantly looking for ways to, to innovate and to raise the bar on quality. Now, everybody in the room knows this is a tough place to recruit to. We have a horrible physician shortage, uh, especially primary care, but other areas too. And so you look at physician to population ratios, and this is one of the toughest places in the whole country. And uh, hopefully if we fast forward 10 years from now, we'll be in a much better place now that we have all this talk about different medical schools. But um, we, we have to do a better job with recruiting and retaining high quality physicians. So there, we, have, we have quite a few, but we need more. I'm, I'm curious, so, um, so I, I assume you probably could have stayed at you know, Intermountain or one of those other hospitals and stayed at that one hospital, but you chose to take other, um, go to other places where there were some challenges, I guess. How did you know that it was the right time to, to take on those challenges, you know? That's a great question. I, I actually, uh, I met with my boss at that time after I'd been there for, I think it was just over 10 years. And um, I was, my wife and I had done some uh, discussion about, you know, our youngest was about to graduate from high school. We were about to become empty nesters. And we thought, you know, as much as we love it here, and it was tough to leave. You know, when you're at any place for 11 years, almost 12, you get really attached. You got friends, neighbors, your own little, you know, <clears throat> uh, things that you go through. and. So that was a tough decision, but um, we're both a little bit adventurous, and we thought, let's go, let's go see other parts of the country. So, in fact, we still we, we still have that house out in Provo, Utah, and uh, you know we have our oldest son, his wife, and kids live there. Um, but uh, it's been a great adventure. I've loved it. So two years in Philly, and then two years in Dallas. It's another story. The Level One Trauma Center, associated with uh, UT. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Southwestern Medical Center. We did a lot of training for that medical school, which is three miles away. We love Dallas. Lived in a high rise on the 11th floor. We just thought, you know, let's experience some new things. Um, so no regrets. But after doing that, we want to settle down. We love California. And uh, anyway, so, but those are tough decisions. But when I went to my boss, getting back to Provo, Utah, I went up to Salt Lake City, met with my boss, Dr. Charles Sorensen, told him that I felt like, on a professional level, I had accomplished just about everything that I wanted to do, and I was ready for a change. And you look around the organization, and I thought, there's really no room here for upward promotion. You know, most people who go there, they stay there till they retire. And one of my best friends, this guy I was telling you about earlier, uh, Larry Hancock, he was CEO just a couple years older than me in Salt Lake, and I thought, you know, he'll move up to corporate office, and maybe that'll help. Anyway, that all didn't happen. We recruited from the outside. I'm just being totally honest with you. Yeah, right. When we brought somebody in from Florida, a COO, who did a great job, by the way, Laura Kaiser, who's now president of Ascension, um, as of a few months ago, uh, I just thought, okay, I, can, I have to decide. I'm 50 years old. Do I want to stay here as regional CEO for the next 15 years? Or am I going to get... I was worried that I might get too complacent. I thought, what else can... So I, I decided... You know, professionally, I'm ready for a move. Talk to my wife. I would not have done it if she hadn't supported me. That's also key. Uh, but she was supportive. She said, yeah, let's try it out. So it was a tough decision on a professional level and on a personal <clears throat> level. So you mentioned that, that your oldest or youngest had just graduated from high school. And I think, um, you know, all of us who are parents, we, we always look at how we balance a career move with a relocation on the impact on our children. Um, has there ever been a time in your career where you felt you compromised, if you will, one of, one of the children that way? Uh, that's a great question. How do those discussions yeah. go? Yeah, that's that's a good, it's a great question, but it's a tough question too. I think time management, getting back to what you discussed earlier, your topic earlier, is is absolutely essential. And I made a commitment years ago, because you know, I'm a real family guy, I got four kids, two, two sons, two daughters. But um, I'm really proud of the fact that I didn't miss any violin recitals, and I didn't miss any Little League baseball games. Now, there are a few that I, I got there late. That was pretty normal, you know, maybe halfway through the game. But, um, and there are times when I'd have my, my little iPhone, or even early in my career before iPhones, I'd have, you know, I, I, my, my, my big laptop and uh, sitting in the bleachers and typing, and then my wife would throw me the elbow, hey, <laughs> Austin's up at bat, you know, so. And then a lot of you guys do that. And you're just multitasking. And I would zero in, or my girls when they were cheerleaders. And I, I'd like to watch the game. I didn't really care about cheerleaders, but I wanted to see my, my kids, of course. So my wife would say, watch Amy, she's about to. So you just try to figure it out. But I tried really hard 
to plan around family activities. And a lot of times that meant you get home from the activity, it's 8.30 p.m., you start getting kids quieted and set up to bed, and, and then you go back in your office and you hunker down and do those next 100 emails. So just try to make it work. I, re I refer to it as my grad school schedule. Yeah, or, yeah. You, you work, you then you know, do some studying, get some food, go back to study. It's a grad school schedule, I like that. And I thought that would get uh, a little easier after grad school, and maybe a little bit, but uh, it's, you know, I, I want to be a realist. It's, uh, I look around the table, and I, kn I know most of the people, well, half the people in this room, and I know how hard they work. And it's, it's uh, would you agree, it's kind of like a grad school schedule? It's hard to turn it off. That's one of the hardest things, but I, I made a commitment years ago that when I pulled into the garage at night and I turned my key off, mentally I was turning off my mind too. I thought, okay, at least for the next two hours I'm going to immerse myself in the moment, you know, helping out my, my kids with homework, my wife with, you know, doing dishes, whatever. I, I would always, and I love doing things, like, I know this sounds crazy, but I actually enjoyed doing the dishes. You know why? I could see immediate results. <laughs> Because a lot of times we don't see enough results. Some of these things are big picture strategy. Or mowing the lawn on Saturday, believe it or not, I loved it. You could just do the strips one at a time and celebrate the accomplishment. So. <laughs> you know, you're in California, so you got to have artificial turf. Right. That's right. <laughs> well, I shouldn't admit this, but I haven't mowed the lawn for a few years. So. <laughs> hey, Dave, you brought up an interesting point earlier about titles and the ability and, and, and team, what, what that means. Um, you know, a lot of, there, there have been people that I've worked with that, that I've mentored that um, we talk about uh, the title, people see title, they see money, they see power, they see control. Back to the point of servant leadership. Yes. Being humble about what you do and how that resonates and enriches the people's lives around you because I think part of our responsibility as leaders is to support the people that are supporting the patients and the families that come into our institution. Absolutely, okay. yeah. And, and you've seen over the years to really kind of hold true to that value. Well, thank How you, I tried. over time yeah. did you continue to keep yeah. your focus on well, John, I appreciate the question. I mean, I, I got to tell you, this is kind of a personal, kind of almost a sensitive issue for me because I've had a, a healthcare um, leadership coach, and I love that. I had the chance to get a coach for about three months, every two weeks. And one of the things that she told me, because we actually did a 360 on me, and she said, you know what I'm hearing? You don't toot your horn enough, and you don't let people know the accomplishments. And so there are things that are going on that people aren't aware of. And she said, you've got to somehow figure out ways to strategically toot your horn. I said, give me some examples. And because, um, yeah, servant leadership, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. That's kind of how I'm wired. And I don't care about who gets the credit. I just want to get the job done. And I told that to Craig when I came to interview here. I said, I'm looking for the right culture and the right team. I'm not really hung up on titles. And um, it's about servant leadership. And when you're in the trenches and you're helping out that, you know, giving words of encouragement to that NICU nurse, or that ED manager who's on overload or whatever. I love doing that kind of thing, the one-on-one. -on -one. Well, you can't check any balance scorecard on that. That takes a lot of our time, and it's important. So, back to your question, Patrick, about priorities. The priorities in these positions sometimes is supporting the people that are doing the work. That's right. So, so if you have to cancel a meeting in, in order to be more accessible to a person that has a, a, a a good question and you can support them in their growth and development and they have a hard question. As far as priorities are concerned, that that, that becomes the priority. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Things around because you know your your create the responsibility of being in a in an executive position is you you're trying like similar I guess to your children. You're trying to create a better life for them when you step out you want part of your legacy to be that you were accessible, you know, that you were there to coach. And sometimes I think, you know, our day, you know, we have these meetings that are back to back to back to back, and all of a sudden, you look at the end of the day and you had to say, I haven't really had any touch points with any of the people that are doing the work. 
you know, it's more complicated than a 700 bed hospital than it is a 200 bed hospital. It's still, but I don't know, does that drive your priorities? Oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, I think um, when I look back over the course of my career, um, one of the things that I miss as I've been running uh, larger hospitals and health systems is the, uh, the personal touch. And, I mean, to this day, if it's 3.30 p.m. and a meeting got canceled and I've got, <coughs> I just picked up 30 minutes or whatever, I love to push away from my desk and go walk down the ED or go up to the NICU and it, it rejuvenates me just to watch people in action, watching the doctors and the nurses taking care of patients. I love that. And there are a lot of days when I don't even do that, and I miss it. When I was running in little rural hospitals, I would go around in the morning, and a lot of times I'd round at night before going home. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll admit, I, I, I would like to tell all of you today that I round an hour a day, and I don't. I'd, I'd love to. I, might, I round probably an hour, hour and a half a week. Some weeks I get up twice, but it's tough. We're buried, as you know, <laughs> with meetings and priorities. And yeah. But I think the individual, you know, that the, the individual touch points that you're talking about is absolutely essential for the organization. So we have about uh, five minutes left before we have to get Dave to do a conference call that came on calendar. So keep going. Great questions. And down the side, maybe. So we've had uh, some community folks with interaction. How about questions from those who aren't part of the community? Community. I'll just make a comment. I've enjoyed this so much. You've Thank got you. a beautiful story. I know a lot of executives. I know Larry Hancock personally. Oh, do you? Yeah, yeah he's a great guy. Okay. You embody what I think a true leader, not a manager, but a leader embodies. You, Thank the, you. The priorities that you have to have, mm -hmm. you have. Servant leadership, I've heard you talk about. Making a, making a difference is my summary of what you said. And those are traits that you don't always see, which is unfortunate, but when you see it, it's your humbleness comes through. And as a servant leader, I just want to say that I'm very impressed with Thank this you. conversation with you. I appreciate the feedback. Okay, well, I'll, I'll close with a couple. So we have, um, so this will be viewed by a lot of, of mid-careers in particular, who um, in, I think in our profession are struggling right now. They're struggling because they see fewer positions opening up, consolidation occurring in the industry, higher standards for academic performance uh, to, for example, become a, a fellow or to, to move up, move around. Um, what advice could you give them today? What encouragement could you give them? I, I would say um, if you're truly passionate about wanting to help people, you're in the right profession. I know that sounds very simple, but you got to figure out what is it that's driving you. And if you if you like business, if you like the, the, the business skills that go along with healthcare, stick with it. Look for the right opportunity. And if that means you have to move somewhere, do it. I think that's really important. Look at life as an adventure. Um, it's nice to be able to settle down someday, but um, but I do think, especially early in your career, you ought to be willing to take on those tough assignments. Um, I've seen a lot of healthcare leaders in my career who, for whatever reason, they weren't willing to move, you know, uh, 100 miles away or whatever, and they, they became kind of stagnant professionally. And uh, sometimes you got to take on the tough assignments to climb the ladder. Um, and I would just say, you know, don't give up. You, and it's easier said than done, but you've got to be resilient. You might have to go through 10 job interviews before you land that job that you really want. And it might take two years to find that right job. But that's okay. Stick with it. It'll happen. And, and then try to constantly uh, polish those skills. The, the, uh, the resume is important to at least open the door to get the interview, but once you're there, you've got to really present and perform. Now, here's the challenge, too. I've, a lot of us who've done a lot of interviewing, I've seen people who interview incredibly well, and they get on the job and they, they can't really perform. I've seen others who don't interview very well at all, and the references check out great. And you take a chance on them, because they didn't interview well, so a lot of people might say, I oh, don't hire that person. You go with your gut anyway, you hire them, and, and I've seen somebody, they just really performed. They knocked it out of the park. So you got to look at all those factors, the references, the resume, the interviewing. Um, but sometimes you do have to go with your gut. True story, I was involved with an interview in this room not long ago with a bunch of doctors and a candidate, and they gave rave reviews to this candidate. You would have thought it was a totally different person when you read the evaluations from the interview teams in the afternoon. And uh, so it, it's a tough process. So I don't want to get hung up on interviews, but for the early careers who are kind of wondering and struggling, 
I, I do share the concern. I understand. I mean, with all, like you said, Joe, about consolidations and downsizing, there aren't as many opportunities as there once were. But they might not be in a traditional acute care setting, but they're going to be more and more open up in other aspects of healthcare. And as more and more health systems consolidate, and they, um, but but yet they develop and they grow along the continuum. Uh, whether it's skilled nursing units or home care or uh, multi-specialty group practices, I would say just be open-minded. Um, I, I would never trade, um, even though it was brief, three years, I would never trade the experience I had in a, in a large academic multi-specialty group in Lubbock, Texas. That taught me a lot about, you know, looking at it through the physician's eyes. So I would say don't be, like I went, you know, HR, finance, and then clinic administration before hospital administration. Well, that was my path, but everybody's path is different and you just got to kind of figure it out for yourself. So there's no one right way, but just stay connected to healthcare because then you can, it's all about helping people and uh, I don't think there's a, a better industry to be in. And yes, we have a lot of bureaucracy. <coughs> yes, high regulation. But after you wade through all that, you just got to say, but at the core, you're helping people. And uh, so that's what gives me a lot of gratification. Thank you for an enjoyable hour. Thank you, Joe.